Hello Make It Yourselfers. Today I have a special treat for you. I just finished an interview with Sally Kate Norton who wrote this book Toxic Superfoods that covers why oxalates in some of these foods that we have now been told are superfoods and super healthy and why they can be causing a lot of us a lot of problems. And she is such a wealth of information and just wonderful to talk to and I really hope that you enjoy this video. Uh, this is Tracy from Oh The Things We'll Make and I am going to be talking with Sally Norton today who wrote the book Toxic Superfoods and I just read this book. It's absolutely amazing. I touched on it a little bit the other day in a short video and it was very brief about oxalates but despite having read this and doing some research on my own, my knowledge pales in comparison to Sally's knowledge on the subject. So I just wanted to welcome you here and thank you so much for dedicating some time to us. Uh, and my blog has a lot of paleo focused foods and recipes. And a lot of these have a lot of nut flours and a lot of nut milks. And I had a very high oxalate diet. So um, I would love for you if you could tell us a little bit what oxalates are, and then we can get into how I found out about it and how I found you. But um, if you could just give a brief explanation about what oxalates actually are and why they're a problem. Well, they're a major set of natural chemicals that come from nature. It's not something that's sprayed on the produce that the plants use to their benefit to survive. And um, a lot of plants that are so high in oxalate are just considered toxic. They have many plants make a lot of toxins. You know, they're um, that's their only survival strategy. And so we, unfortunately, we're not really weeding out the plants we're eating according to their oxalate content and we're eating a lot of it and oxalate is this really small molecule comes it's called oxalic acid is the parent compound and this is a chelating little two carbon molecule so it is tiny it just dissolves in water and floats around in water and it easily enters the body and we're just not paying attention to the fact that this chelator which grabs minerals and we use it as a cleaner we've been using it in industrial cleaning since the late 1700s we still can buy it in cleaners like Barkeeper's Friend and Wood Bleach. They use it in industry to do things like strip the rust off of metal items like engines. You can take the rust out of your patio, but, but basically all you need to do that is a spinach smoothie. That's what's... Enough oxalate and spinach and spinach and smoothies and I chard. I'm so happy to be sneaking in some spinach into smoothies for my for my son, you know. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I even have a, a post on the blog, which is the, the Popeye smoothie, where you sneak that spinach in to get those good vitamins in for, you know, kids, because you don't really notice it. It gives that vibrant green color. So... <laughs> well, this is a technique now that's being promoted, like force vegetables down your kid's throat by hiding them in foods. Yes. And uh, that's like a whole new art with motherhood. And it's really unfortunate because the science has been showing since the early 1930s that spinach given to infants is incredibly dangerous uh, because it, it's a chelator of calcium. It causes devastating calcium deficiency. And calcium is critical to all cells and all beings, but especially important for growing children. And so you're creating calcium problems and other nutrient problems and oxidative stress and inflammation in children because this high oxalate foods are currently popular, but it, they're not popular based on actual science. People think there's science behind this. It's just a cultural fad we're in right now where we've elevated the kind of now and then vegetable to a daily must have. And it's really causing problems and it's quite dangerous to do to children. And it's unfortunate that people in positions of influence have been promoting this as some kind of uh, natural thing for humans to do, to blend up uh, seasonal produce and drink it every day. Right. And that's one of the things that um, well, I, I found out the hard way. I, on a whim, started the carnivore diet. And about a week into it, and I, I have a history, and I think you also have a history of a lot of antibiotics growing up. And we can talk a little bit about 
why that might be that, that people have, who have problems with oxalates have this problem with uh, antibiotics. And, but I had a lot of ear infections. I ended up breaking my eardrum. And then after mm-hmm. that, I mean, that was one after another. And then it moved to my throat. I kept having strep throat. They almost took my tonsils out, but I didn't show it because I was old enough to know enough at the, by that point we had the internet and I didn't show up to that appointment, but then it moved down to urinary tract infections, just one after another. And I hear that's also another, a common symptom for oxalate problems. Isn't that? Yes. (laughs) How old were you when all that was going on? Well, that was, you know, when the ear infections, I was probably, you know, four or five, I think, you know, I was very young. And then it ended up moving to my throat as I was in middle school and high school and even college. And, you know, it started with the urinary tract infections then too. And then it was throughout college and dental school. And, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> so Did your mom feed you guys things like peanut butter and potatoes growing up. Yeah, definitely. And peanut butter was probably one of the the few things that I would eat for because we didn't have a cafeteria at my school. So Mm -hmm. for me, um, you know, and I didn't particularly like white bread. So, you know, to get me to eat some sort of sandwich or something, I think we even I had this teacher in third grade who was criticizing my mom because the only thing I would eat was like the fruit roll up in my lunch. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, she probably had to start giving me peanut butter because I wouldn't eat like a ham sandwich or anything like that. (laughs) Yeah. And peanut butter doesn't spoil either. So I I think people like slapping it together and throwing it in a bag for lunch because if there's no refrigeration, you feel good about that. I think luckily now with the whole allergy problem, uh, you know, a lot of places aren't allowing people to bring uh, peanut butter and that type of thing to to school. So although here in Spain, I've never heard anything like that. It's more in in the United States. So (laughs) do they eat peanut butter in Spain much? Not really, not really, but they have almonds in everything. Almonds are in everything and, you know, even any of the treats and, you know, the, the only type baked dessert that people tend to make here is called the Coca Maria. And a lot of times it's either all with almond flour or half almond flour and just a lot of it. And even all the Christmas foods are, you know, we have turron and we have mazapan and all of these desserts are very heavily almond based. So I I do have some clients from Spain. (laughs) Maybe that's why. I can imagine because almonds are in everything. And I that's becoming a thing worldwide. Once California figured out they could grow endless almonds and are mowing down whatever to put in almond grows, we seem to have a a plenty of almonds to do lots of damage across the planet with. And that's a major um, high oxalate food that's also full of lots of other problematic compounds and including probably mold contamination that's really bad for the digestive tract. And in the digestive tract, health matters a lot with the oxalate problem because when you get into some inflammation in the body, particularly um, gut-related inflammation, any kind of leaky gut, your the amount of oxalate that's getting from the food into your bloodstream goes way up dramatically. It can go up four or five, six times the what would be considered a normal Uh, amount. And it seems like even the estimates of what's a normal percentage of what we call absorption when the oxalate moves from the food side of the gut into the bloodstream side of the gut, call that absorption. And that rate seems to be going up. They used to say it was five to 8%. Now they say it's 10 to 15%. Anything over 15 is abnormal. And anybody with any kind of leaky gut could be absorbing. I mean, one estimate was outrageously high, like something like 67%. Wow, that's past like the 10 or 15 normal for that's that makes for a gigantic exposure and it means that you don't have to be eating huge quantities of the super high oxalate foods you could just be just eating fries and potato chips and a little bit of peanut butter the occasional Reese's cup because chocolate and peanut butter both are high in oxalate <laughs> or doing a wheat-free diet if you're going on a grain-free diet you tend to move from moderately high-ish foods to much higher foods because buckwheat, quinoa, taff, these sort of gluten-free 
quasi grains that are sometimes and allowed almond. on peeling. I mean, and paleo we use nuts and flour. Just nuts. Nuts. it's not normal for humans to live on nuts. They're the they're the baby of a tree. The tree doesn't want you to eat it. They're not designed to be digestible. They're designed to be delivered to the ground and to be able to survive whatever assaults and attempts to to be eaten. So they're nuts and seeds are designed to be indigestible. And we're turning them into a staple food that's never happened in, in all of hi human history. And somehow we think we can just make up a new food and pretend it's safe for everyone with absolutely no safety questions, no thoughts of a possible downside to it. Yeah, it's quite interesting that if you start talking about the carnivore diet and they say, well, it's not safe because we haven't tested this, but, you know, <laughs> you know, and <laughs> but it's OK to eat modern junk food. It's OK to eat high oxalate foods, which we have science that says that's bad, but it's not OK to eat a paleolithic like hunting hunting gathering diet like they've done in Alaska and done in uh, you know pre-industrial eras. For a million years, people were living basically in the ice age on an iceberg, hunting woolly mammoth and giant sloth and having barbecues all the time and, and doing really well, uh, surviving lack of heat, lack of any modern comforts and, and doing very well. In fact, moving around and populating the entire earth um, with innovation and ability to cross seas and travel safely and reproduce. It's amazing what we could do on just some woolly mammoth. And do you think maybe this is like a, a chicken and the egg type question, but uh, do you think that those of us who've had all of these problems with antibiotics and, you know, that's causing it so that we have more issues with the oxalates, or do you think it's, you know, somehow we are more sens sensitive to the oxalates and then that's what caused us to get sicker and have, or maybe it's just cyclical and, well, there's a combination of way more exposure to oxalate foods now in a, in a in more consistently year round. So on the exposure side, so there's the tolerance and vulnerability side, which is really important. And then there's the exposure side. And universally, we're all at a level of exposure that's higher than ever because life used to be seasonal. Even in the 1970s, people still ate fruit in the summer and hardly any in the winter or it was dried and they didn't eat spinach year round. But really when we invented the train and refrigeration and the grocery store, we started getting access to certain foods more times around the year. But back when I was growing up in the late 60s and 70s, nuts were happening in December for holidays and occasionally as garnishes at fancy meals, but they were not offered as a day-to-day -day thing to eat. Uh, so that's all really new. And, and a lot of the new fangled things are laced with chocolate and plantain and, and, and really high oxalate foods. I mean, when I was growing up, kids did not like dark chocolate. Adults didn't like dark chocolate. <laughs> it was really only about 25 years ago when we started saying, oh, this is going to be so good for your health. It might help you not get Alzheimer's or something silly, which is quite the opposite of the truth. Um, people started using these sort of vice foods like chocolate and wine because we're being told they have healthy qualities because it's a great marketing story. You can sell, you can sell, sell, sell people anything that gives them like pleasure foods. And if you get this little, we put a real health polish on anything we want to sell. Any right. idea in any product we want to sell, I and we're you would buying it hook, line, and sinker. So we're eating a lot more of these foods, and now with the whole blender and smoothie deal, and like the phytonutrient theory, which is a <laughs> failed theory, we're going crazy with it. And then on the other side, our our vulnerability and intolerance to this day and day is just a human thing. Like you're not meant to eat more than your body can handle every day of the year. Now you can get away with more than your body handle here and there if you take the winter off, like we did in the old days, living on venison and fish and whatever, because there just wasn't a lot of spinach plants hanging around in the backyard in January in most people's lives. So, but the vulnerability side is worse because of the antibiotics, the uh, use of pain medications, both of those cause severe changes to the gut health. And liver and kidney health. And you need all of those things to be able to deal with the oxalate exposure, which is past what you can deal with anyway. And then you add in this additional vulnerability. Also trauma, anything that causes inflammation and 
leaky gut, bariatric surgery. There's many things that we're doing in modern time that causes us to absorb more than that sort of normal 10%. And we may be absorbing way more and we may have more stress on the liver because of the oxalates and because of other things. The liver doesn't do anything about detoxing oxalate. It has no enzymes whatsoever that can break it down, metabolize it in any way. In fact, the liver creates oxalate. So the liver adds more oxalate to the body. It doesn't detox oxalate. The only thing you could do with oxalate is excrete it. You have to get it out of the body and the kidneys have the bulk of that job, but your body tries to get rid of it in other ways with the saliva and the tears and the probably even the lungs make an effort, but the skin for sure and the colon for sure are um, potential exit routes for oxalate, but it just leaves the body. You don't metabolize oxalate. You make more oxalate when you have liver stress you have more liver stress when you eat a lot of oxalate. And in, in many ways with this, the oxalate's damaging the gut, causing more absorption. The oxalate's damaging the liver, causing other detox problems for things that can do so. It's um, both the vulnerability side and the exposure side. And, and you can't blame just one or the other all the time, except with exposure, at some point, it's too much for anybody because it is a universal poison that can kill anybody, even with really high tolerance. You may be seeming to get away with it for a long time, but I don't know that many people who are free of the symptoms that oxalate causes, which are That's mood problems and aches and pains and stomach problems and anxiety. Uh, this is really getting more and more common where people are struggling mentally and emotionally and struggling with aches and pains and struggling with digestive problems kidney and uh, urinary tract problems are happening more and more at younger and younger ages. If you have a jumpy bladder or have to pee a lot or ever get burning pee or get some kind of pelvic pain, this can all be oxalates. And so I, you know, I was getting them every month for a while. It was the UTIs and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, actually, and see, the oxalate is like a bacteria in that it turns on the, the inflammation in the bladder. So it forms these crystals. Is it, it, it goes from oxalic acid, comes into the body, it grabs calcium and other minerals somewhere along the way, either from your blood or the tissues or in the while it's traveling in the kidneys. And it forms these crystals. And the crystals, especially the nanocrystals, which are smaller than cells, they're super invisible. They're the most toxic form. That turns on kind of a rash program. There's these mast cells and immune cells in the bladder. And it turns on the same response you would get if you had a bacterial infection. So the symptoms of oxalate in the bladder can look exactly like a UTI. And people go for years just medicating the symptoms and not even doing a culture to see the difference. Well, and interestingly, it, oxalate will create the infection too. Right. I think, you know, in my case it was, but I think that I did have what you were talking about, about a week into the carnivore diet where I started getting symptoms, but it didn't feel like it was going into a full blown UTI. And so I didn't go into the emergency. And, um, you know, I took D manos right away, because that's the one thing that has sometimes helped. But I thought this is so strange that I would have cloudy urine and, you know, just urgency, but it wasn't uh, developing into a full blown urinary tract infection. And, you know, I've had so many of them, I can, I can tell that feeling you get. And it just I don't know. And it, it went away and then it would come back and I would have bouts of cloudy urine. But then, you know, by that point I had researched a little bit and at the time you hadn't come out with the book yet, you were working on it. And I was like, Oh, I need to get that book when it comes out because I was noticing a lot of the symptoms and, you know, I had eczema that was not going away and it was getting mm -hmm. worse. And actually, um, you know, this last year I haven't posted a lot. And I was a person who I took my computer with me when we went on a cruise and I would work on posts because I loved it. It was something, you know, this blog for me was a labor of love and something that I love to do. And I basically took all of 2022 off because I had such brain fog that I, I just, it was either fatigue or when I would write, I just wouldn't 
feel like I knew what to write anymore. It was just crazy. But if you heard my uh, my diet at the time, you would laugh. I started off the morning with, I, I'm sure matcha probably is much more concentrated than just regular tea because you have the, the full leaf there. I don't know. But I would have this matcha smoothie with an alternate nut milk. Um, luckily, most of the time I I went towards coconut, but I would have homemade almond milk, which is worse, and chia seeds to make it more filling so I wouldn't eat until later. And then my go-to snack was celery and almond butter. And, you know, sometimes I would make little energy bars with nuts and seeds. And, and then dinner was lots of vegetables. And so I crazy. And dessert was always- So easy to get dark. into trouble. And so that was 2022, you were eating like that? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. All the time, all the time. And I was all the time. <laughs> you could feel that brain fog. Were you getting the, the bladder symptoms again? Actually, um, I only had one infection, I think, uh, last year, but I was very- That's so interesting to me because it, it makes me think about how when you're really overdoing it and it's really inflaming you, your body's busy holding on to it, trying to protect your vascular system, your heart and your kidneys. And you may have lowered your excretion relative to the amount you're in. One thing I was getting was Bartholin cysts. I don't know if you're familiar with that. And, but that also is in the area and with, you know, bacteria uh, associated. I'm not sure all of what goes into that, but I was also getting eczema. Like it would not go away. And it was just, it would keep me up at night. I would scratch and, and, you know, so my skin (laughs) was one of the, but it's interesting that you say this about, you think that everybody at one point, because I I hear people, I've been talking about oxalates to a lot of people lately, and they're like, well, that's just the people who are sensitive. And I was actually made aware of the whole oxalate thing about 10 years ago. And I kind of brushed it off because at the time when I looked it up on Google, it was basically like, well, if you don't have kidney stones and you don't eat spinach, a lot of spinach. And so I just made sure that I would only do every once in a while. And luckily I knew. So my son did have the occasional spinach smoothie, but not very often. So (laughs) in that case, I was lucky. But um, a lot of people will say either it, you know, only the people who are sensitive to them should worry about oxalates or that, you know, as long as you have probiotics or something like that, and you fix your gut that, you know, you can get away with them. And I know that you don't really push probiotics. So I would love for you to comment on that and your thoughts on (laughs) that statement. I think there's room for a whole discussion about this idea of sensitivity. It's really more of a tolerance thing that your tolerance goes down the more you have leaky gut and the more you're wearing your system out and the more you're in chronic inflammation because chronic inflammation will cause the liver to produce more. And so you're getting it from both inside and outside. Um, and so, but you think about smoking as an analogy. Back in the 1950s, everybody smoked. But in the 1960s and 70s, not everybody was carrying around oxygen tanks and in uh, lung cancer therapy. That didn't stop us from putting warning signs on cigarettes and telling people there's a lot of risk if you smoke and it's not good for other people around you either. And and so you don't have a way to know if your smoking habit's going to take you out in one way or another, give you lung cancer or give you tongue cancer or give you you know, various lung disorders, but you probably shouldn't smoke anyway. (laughs) And oxalate is a poison like mercury or arsenic. It is, it just, it takes longer to get you. And the body knows about oxalate and has techniques for protecting you from it, but you're just really using up your body's reserve to get away with a high oxalate diet, which is unnecessary. It's completely in your control. Unlike secondhand smoke and unlike most things like air pollution and the other things that are really getting on us, you really have control over what you choose to eat if you have the information. Unfortunately, this has been missing because the overlords are saying all along, I mean, even in the 1930s, when there was enough animal studies and enough human infant feeding studies to demonstrate that giving spinach to children is really dangerous, the medical societies 
nutrition arm said, you know what, we're not going to distinguish spinach from the other greens. It's, yeah, it's probably not a big deal. And they've been doing this kind of uh, excuse and ignore approach and yeah, it's bad, but who cares kind of attitude in the medical literature and the nutrition literature for a long time. And it's getting really dangerous now that people think spinach is some kind of superhero. Right. So in terms of sensitivity and tolerance, well, I don't like the word sensitivity because it suggests that you have an allergic problem with it. And it, although oxalates can give you a lot of allergic problems and make you suddenly sensitive to everything, it's that oxalates are making you sensitive. It's not that you're sensitive to them. It's that your tolerance level may be different and your exposure level may be crazy. Maybe your mom was eating it when you were a fetus. Maybe you were giving it in early childhood at the wrong times and your your body's um, coping is not what it what it might be if you were the guy next door who's getting away with it. But it's really sad to say, well, because Fred Smith is fine on it and he eats it all the time, we should all just ignore oxalate. I've never heard such a most irresponsible concept in my life. And I'm really tired of hearing about that. Yeah. Well, I wanted to touch on that because I thought it was really important. And um, it is you know, important. The it's dismissive it's stuff is what's getting people in trouble. Give people a chance. Tell them there's a pothole over here. There is a downside. Why are you pretending there's no downside when we have all this science? What are you selling? What are, what are you trying to prove to people? I mean, I, you can hear me. I'm I'm really discouraged that grown-ups would tell people, eh, whatever, jump off that cliff. Doesn't matter. <laughs> right. And it's you know, really un irresponsible. It's not for my, I'm a public health person. We believe in things like the precautionary principle. If there's risk, you put up a little bit of a sign or a little bit of a, a guard on the edge of the road. There's a cliff here. We'll put up a little safety rail, put a little label here that says this could be dangerous. Be aware of this, not stay ignorant and pretend in your innocence that you can do whatever you want. Right. Well, I think, you know, within the Healthy Living Bloggers group, a lot of us started blogging because we had issues with our health and we were looking for something. And a lot of these bloggers would continue to have issues, even though we thought we were eating such healthy diets. And so that's why I thought it was so important to talk to you today, because I noticed that you were coming up a lot in the carnivore community, but not in the paleo community. And I think so many people who are following these quote unquote healthy diets like paleo and, you know, at least Paleo does exclude the legumes. And um, if you do audio, autoimmune paleo, you even exclude nuts and seeds, but most people don't go that far. So I thought it was really important to touch on that with you so that people in this community, people who have a lot of food intolerances, and sadly, a lot of the recipes on my blog are very heavily focused on these foods. And I don't plan on taking down the recipes. I'm going to look for a way to put some sort of note on them, some sort of disclaimer, because I think that they're a good source of information for people. If they're going to make my nut and seed granola bar, you know, uh, <laughs> to, to know that there might be an issue with this. I thought that this was healthy at one time, but you know, I'm, I'm very happy to admit when I'm wrong. And it, it makes you very special. <laughs> <laughs> and nuts and seeds really, really kick your gut. I mean, they're so full of anti-nutrients. They're designed to be indigestible. They're meant to be the next generation of the plant. They're so protected with oxalate crystals and other chemicals. They're really quite dangerous for people who want to have healthy digestion. So please do let people know that nuts and seeds are probably not the way to health. But I think what's really valuable for everyone to see on public display is that we can be sick on what we're doing and wanna keep doing it and even promoting it for other people and claiming it's so great, even though it's not working. Right. And it was, it was clearing up some things. I think just dropping the processed foods and the sugar and yeah. you, know, you heal some things, but certain things just don't get better. But, and, um, and you don't have any way to connect them to the food because no one's having this conversation that, you know, you start eating sweet potatoes every day like I did and all this stuff started happening. I never, ever put that together that by adding the daily sweet potato, 
that that's why I suddenly have knots in the back of my, right where my shoulder blade is. And I couldn't sleep at night because it was like somebody put a knife in my back. And I got this bump on my head and I got so wrinkles here. Than potatoes. Have it's so great. It, it was no <laughs> allergy. You know, I knew I was reacting to weed. I knew I was now super reactive to beans and all the legumes. I had to cut them out. I'm like, what am I going to eat? I'm a vegan. I can't eat beans and I can't eat wheat. And so I added the sweet potato as the saving starch because no one's allergic to sweet potato. That's a low allergy food. I was convinced of that. I did that for over 20 years not hearing that my body wasn't liking that decision. It's very hard to tell. So, you know, that's the sad part is like, we don't know how to read our body's feedback. You know, and we're not willing to do it because we want our, we want our cultural beliefs to trump our own reality. There is so much I would love to talk to you about, because I think this is so interesting. And I know that you've also mentioned in the book that with, um, when you start going lower oxalate, a lot of people can actually tolerate some of these food intolerances. And I had a lot of issues with dairy, and I've noticed that I can tolerate it a lot better now. But I know that you um, that you also are very busy and that you had another meeting or, or interview or something scheduled and that you have to be going. So what I would like to do is give you a chance to let everybody know, uh, you know, where we can find you. And, you know, definitely get the book. It's amazing. I've read through it once. I've gone through lots of the chapters and I keep finding little tidbits because you throw in these little tiny tidbits that are really interesting just in, in the middle of another paragraph about something else. And I love that. So <laughs> I'm so glad you're reading the book. This is like, I'm, I'm just trying to offer people information that's been missing in the story of nutrition and, and offer a little SOS for people who are not doing great and really need new options. This is, it's so surprising. I can remain shocked at how getting the oxalates out of your diet can be a miracle cure. And it's so easy to switch to romaine lettuce instead of spinach. And, and some of the things might be a little more challenging, but just being informed is really the place to go. And so I'm, I'm hoping people will pick up the book and have it as a, um, a guide to really starting to learn this. There's, I don't know, maybe... I don't know, almost 600 references or something. So there's- Oh yeah, I noticed. I'm thinking, oh, wow, this is so long. And then I realized that the whole- the whole end of the book is references and they're amazing. And I actually want to go through some of those, but yeah, it's really cool reading to go read the actual <laughs> truth. And there's a lot more. I mean, I could have stuffed it. I tried not to stuff it and keep the references limited, but enough so people could get into the literature for people who are library geeks like me. But yeah, I mean, just, I'm inviting the world to come think a new thought. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, I will be also adding all of the links to your website, to your book, and to you on social media in the description. So people who want to learn more, definitely look down there. And yeah, maybe we can chat again sometime in the future. Once I've been uh, longer on this, I've been doing this about four months. I only drink oxalates now, a few of them, uh, to keep <laughs> just a little bit in my system and not just go crazy all at once. But I don't eat a lot of them anymore. So, so you're doing sort of a carnivore plus oxalates, or it's, it's carnivore, just a little bit of tea to keep my yeah, mostly perfect. So yeah, that's <laughs> great because the carnivore diet is helpful because it gets rid of that that fiber and the irritants from the seeds and and is good for helping the gut be happier and then everything else can be in better shape if you're not irritating it with your diet and then adding some oxalate in like that helps your body to to that's a whole nother chapter that we can talk about maybe in a future discussion definitely i would love how to the body's that. getting over this problem and how you have to like kind of communicate with it about don't go too crazy on trying to heal too fast Definitely. I would love that. So thank you so much. It has been great talking to you. And you're always just, you're such uh, a source of knowledge and information. It's, it's amazing. So thank you. I'm so glad that you guys are picking this up. It's really cool that we're have this internet and, and you're wanting to help people discover this. I'm, I really appreciate Definitely. it. Thank I'm you. I'm just so trying much. to figure the best way of, uh, fixing up the old stuff but um <laughs> well, that that's a very interesting question you know this is great this could be a uh it's an, another thing for us to ponder as a community how to like say oops sorry <laughs> <laughs> all right well thank you so much <laughs>
Thank you. Be well. I hope you enjoyed that interview. There were so many other questions that I would have loved to have asked Sally. So perhaps in the future, when I've done a little bit more healing, we can get together and chat a little bit more and get some more information to you. Meanwhile, I will be writing a post uh, reviewing her book. I think it's an absolutely amazing book. She did so much work on this, and you can tell it's so well researched. Just like all of these references that I would love to just start getting into myself and taking a look to see some of this information and just see it firsthand. But you can tell when she talks, she just has this passion for the subject and she really wants people to know about it because once you find healing, it just gives you this new renewed energy to try to get other people to heal in the same way you have because you want them to feel as good as you feel now. At least that's how I feel. So I will be going through a lot of my posts. I don't plan on taking them down, but I do plan on making some sort of disclaimer or note on them just so that I, they can serve as a learning purpose. And if somebody wants to make almond butter and almond granola bars or whatever, that's fine. But to do so in moderation and with the knowledge that this may not be the health food that we've been taught that it is. So many of us have been looking for healing for so long and so many people are so lost and don't know where to look. This is an issue for so many people who don't realize it's an issue. And maybe you think you don't have issues with oxalates, but it should at least be something that you have a limited awareness of so that you don't overload on them and eventually make them a major problem for you. With all of that, I hope you are having a great day and we will talk soon. Mm -hmm.